Thank you for downloading the Start the Week podcast from BBC Radio 4. For more information, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. Hello. Tim Peake is somewhere up there on the International Space Station preparing for today's spacewalk as he helps improve our understanding of survival beyond the atmosphere. Down here, meanwhile, half the population seems demented with excitement about the latest Star Wars film, so it's a good day to have a serious look at intergalactic travel and the future of mankind in deep space. We're going to be talking about potential alien life forms, Earth-like planets in other solar systems and the problems of long-term space exploration. I'm joined by Carol Haswell, who researches exoplanets, by the astrophysicist and former astronomer Royal Martin Rees, by Kevin Fong, a doctor specialising in space medicine and this year's Royal Institution Christmas lecturer, and by the current star of serious science fiction, Stephen Baxter. It's hard to think of a more appropriate subject to be talking about this week or a better team to have with me for Blast Off. Kevin Fong, um, we're, 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 talking, we're going to be talking about people in space over periods of time, but you specialise in what happens to the human body outside gravity, and it's quite dramatic. Yeah, I mean, space is the most extreme environment of all, really. And without gravity, your body changes in pretty profound ways. Your muscles waste, your bones waste, your and, heart... And the big and muscles waste. go very quickly. I hadn't realised how quickly. Really quickly. So your quads just melt away uh, uh, in, in your legs. Uh, and uh, so that, that's all the stuff that you might have predicted. And then there's effects on your inner ear, so your system of balance and coordination. So astronauts feel sick or are sick for the first few days in space. I mean, I think, you know, that, that might have been what Tim was feeling up there the last few days. Um, and then and then, as you go on, other systems are affected as well. The way that your bl body manufactures blood cells, you get a space anemia, you get immune suppression so it's it not sounds pleasant. fairly grim and we, we've been watching him with a great big smile on his face doing his space somersaults and so forth just tell us about the kind of things he's had to do to prepare himself for this so it's a long training. I mean, he was selected something like six years ago now, and he had to go through basic training to just get familiar with uh, uh, the, the general operations, general duties of an astronaut. And then he would have had, when he was assigned to this mission, some very specific training for his role in this mission, how to uh, uh, fly aboard the Soyuz capsule that took him to station, what his duties would be on board, and then drill after drill after drill of emergencies, what if, what if type scenarios. So he's been in caves in Siberia, he's been all over the place. He's been in caves, been diving, been learning how to survive in the wild if his capsule comes down somewhere by accident. So yeah, he's he's been pretty, he's been pretty, pretty, pretty thoroughly beasted, yeah. Stephen Baxter, in your very enjoyable novel Ark, you envisage people travelling through deep space, not just for a, a few months or a week or a year, but for generations. So people are actually born inside the spacecraft and die inside the spacecraft before it's reached its target. Do you think it's actually physically possible for people to live in space for that long? Well, it's a good question because over and above the medical kind of physical issues that Kevin's spoken about, you have psychological issues. It depends how long the, 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 the journey is or the confinement. Because in a way, wherever you go in space, it's the same thing. If you're in a, a, a long-term uh, orbital habitat or a dome on Mars for years or off on, say, an interstellar mission that might take generations, um, you're, there, there are similarities. You're confined within a small space, an artif entirely artificial environment, like broad casting house, you know, as if they locked the doors and never let you out again. And you raised your kids in here. It's hideous. It's, hideous uh, possibility. Hideous. Uh, for Children the ch raised in broadcasting house would look well, very strange. <laughs> well, and, and the... Uh, it, it would be like raising, raising a child in a cage if you think about it. You could never mm. let them out without really strict um, procedures and so forth. Even the kind that Kevin's talked about for, for Tim Peake. Um, so uh, so over, over a period of decades, it would be a kind of psychological issue. But over a period of perhaps of, 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 of centuries, you, you get a into a kind of cultural issue. How do you run a society when you have the, that degree of confinement and dependence on central issues? If you've ever seen the movie Total Recall, you will remember that the, the dependence on a central uh, oxygen supply is a bad thing because the dictator can switch it off and stage, leave you gasping. Yes. Well, come on to, I want to come on to the politics of long-term space travel a bit later on, yeah. but there will be some people listening to this thinking, well, actually, OK, Tim, Tim Peake's up there going round and round, not that far away, but we're talking about something which is still unimaginably distant. Martin Rees, it's not unimaginably distant because we're not that far away from a mission to Mars, a manned mission to Mars, are we? Well, it's being talked about and it could be funded, of course. Had the Apollo programme momentum been maintained in the 70s, 
there'd be footprints on Mars by now, but of course, after the Americans landed people on the moon, uh, they'd beaten the Russians, and so the momentum was, was lost. That. It could happen. Uh, the question is whether it'll be done as a prestige effort by the Americans or the Russians, or whether it'll be done by some privately funded venture. And there is a privately funded venture trying to do it, isn't there, within three or four years' time? Well, they're going to put people in orbit around the Earth uh, within that period, but they will within 10 or 20 years, be able to send people, if not to land on Mars, to go round Mars and come back. And that takes about a year and a half. And it's been said that the ideal crew is a stable middle-aged couple, happy to be cooped up for that length of time and old enough not to be too concerned about the radiation that they'd encounter. Well, I can so think it won't of a few be a pleasant trip. Available. <laughs> now, um, you're going to be speaking in the Science Museum early in the new year on the subject of human space life Space flight, is it worth the money and risk? So just give us your, your verdict on that quickly. Well, of course, it's hugely expensive. I mean, we all applaud the fact that uh, Tim Peake is up in the space station. That's cost the UK about uh, £12 million. I think it's worth it. But, of course, he's riding along on an investment which is 10,000 times larger than that, building a space station. Whether that's worthwhile, I don't know. And my personal view is that the future of manned spaceflight uh, will be cut-price, high-risk projects funded privately because it's much more expensive to do things as safely as NASA or ESA has to do with civilian astronauts. But if you're a billionaire, you can cut corners and take risks and enjoy the ride. Absolutely, and good luck to them. Yeah, mm. absolutely. You said, was this International Space Station worth it? One thing that strikes me, however, is all the way through this deteriorating relationship between Putin and the West. It's the one project where the Americans and the Russians have stayed together all the way through, no apparent problems. It's been a great international moment, hasn't it, Kevin? Yes, and, it, and it's actually this year's the 40th anniversary of the Apollo soyuz test project, which first saw Americans and Russians cooperate in space in 1975. I mean, it's almost the first thing I remember being taken downstairs to watch that uh, uh, those scenes unfold on my black and white TV when I was four years old um, and so it is one of those very positive things, it is one of the few things that has gone through all of the political upheavals that the Soviet Union and then Russia have had with the United States so you know there, there is some hope there what started as a surrogate battlefield for nuclear war has become this project of international cooperation in science and exploration so there is hope now, none of this matters very much unless we find planets out there on which we could plausibly live. Um, what is an exoplanet, Carol? So an exoplanet is a planet which orbits around another star. So the planets that we're most familiar with orbit around our own sun. So just anything outside our own solar system? Anything outside our own solar system, yes. Yeah. So until 20 years ago, we didn't know of any planets around stars other than our own sun. So that made putting ourselves in context really very difficult because we only had this single example and we didn't know if we were the only system of planets. This could be the only planets. livable planet, yes. planet in the entire we system. We could have been the only planets in the entire galaxy, possibly. Um, we now know that planets are probably more common than stars. Now, I'm fascinated by why we know that. Explain to us, because we can't see them even now. Um, the planets, okay. they're too small, they're too dark. So there's a number of different ways that we can detect planets and... Most of them, almost all of them, depend on studying the star that the planet is orbiting around. So there are two most important ways that have given us the bulk of our discoveries and also the most indisputable evidence that we're not being fooled by something that looks a bit like a planet. So the first one of those is to actually look at the motion of the star and because the planet makes the star wobble, is that yes. right, basically it? So we think about the star, uh, we think about planets orbiting stars, but if you think about it from the point of view of physics, the planet and the star are both masses and they both obey the same laws of gravity and motion. So actually the planet and the star orbit around the common centre of mass of the system. So the planet has a big orbit around the centre of mass of the system because the star is much, much, much more massive, so the centre of mass is much closer to the star, so the star has a much smaller orbit, but nonetheless it is orbiting, obeying exactly the same laws of physics. And we're very lucky as astronomers because we can collect light, and light is incredibly informative. So well, by... I was going to ask, if you could only watch the wobble, how can you possibly tell whether the thing making the star wobble slightly is livable on or is just a vast mass of gas or whatever? So if you only watch the wobble, then all you know 
is how much mass you have causing the wobble and how long it takes for the the orbit to complete. So you immediately know how long the length of the year is on the planet. And okay. planets that are close in have short years. Planets that are further out have long years. That's just the way the laws of gravity and motion work. And we know how hot the star is, so you can work out the temperature that the planet should have. So you can work out roughly how hot the planet should be, but very little else. Kevin, uh, and I, I mean, I absolutely love this whole era of, uh, of, of astronomy because, you know, when I was finishing studying astrophysics b before I went to medical school, we had no observational evidence of any planets. I remember a lecturer saying to me, we're pretty sure there are planets out there outside our own solar system, but we've never, ever seen any. And since then, we've just been finding them, you know, uh, hand over fist, and, and and it's been wonderful to see this. Uh, if if it had been around when I was an undergraduate, I might not have gone into medicine. I think. Martin Rees. No, it has indeed made the night sky far more interesting because we look up at the sky and we know that almost every star that we see is surrounded by planets. And, of course, special interest attaches to planets that could be habitable and are like the Earth, and that requires two things. First, the sort of uh, size and mass of the Earth and secondly, to be at the distance from their star such that water can exist, neither freezing all the time nor boiling away. And what's especially interesting is that some planets of that kind have been discovered, and if we extrapolate to the rest of the galaxy, it's probable that there could be actually a billion planets which are Earth-like in that sense. That's an astonishing thought. Would you share that view, Carol? These, we could call them kind of um, little green planets or little <laughs> blue planets or whatever. I think we might be being a little bit premature to go that far because I think there's a whole range of things that can make a planet not habitable, even if those initial things look yeah. promising. And we're still yeah. at the point where there's quite a lot of uncertainty in the statistics. So I think it would be premature to start putting numbers on that, mm. but certainly it looks very unlikely that the Earth is going to be the only example of a planet like this. Martin. Yes. Well, of course, uh, habitable is not the same as inhabited, and uh, we don't know how life began on the Earth. It could be such a rare fluke it hadn't happened anywhere else. On the other hand, it could be that uh, most of these planets which are like the Earth do have water and have some form of life, and in 10 or 20 years, our telescopes will be powerful enough to perhaps look at the nearest of these and see if they do have some sort of biosphere. That would be exciting. But at the moment, all bets are off as to uh, how many have any kind of life on them. It could be no others. It could be billions. Carol, you spend your life looking at them, so tell us what you think. Well, I, I think I would definitely have agreed with Martin that we should not speculate about life, really, at, at this point, until I learned that actually life on the Earth arose very, very promptly after the late heavy bombardment. So there was a time in the early solar system where there was lots of chaotic asteroids and bits of rock flying around and all of the planets were being bombarded all of the time, which would continually sort of reset any developing life. Very, very promptly after that period, there is now evidence that primitive life arose on Earth. So I think it's quite likely that life is widespread. Stephen, your novel, Ark, depends upon the idea... The idea is the Earth floods catastrophically and the only way out for a lot of people seems to be up. And so they are in this capsule, this space capsule, searching for an exoplanet that is going to be one of the ones that we've been talking about, the little green ones that are habitable and so forth. But not very much has to go wrong to make what looks habitable inhabitable. Yep. Uninhabitable, I beg your pardon. Well, yes, that's true. Perhaps, there, are, perhaps there, are, there may be a scale eventually of partial habitability. You know, mm. there may be locations on this planet which which are which are suitable. It may be too close to the star. It may be too far from the star. Just slightly, the star may flare. Um, but in the book, they head for the the, the, uh, the planets of a, of a, a red dwarf star, an M-class star. And I, uh, okay, we're going to have to explain that. I'm afraid. Yeah. To well, well, stars come in a variety of sizes, and there's Martin recently over there. But but uh, uh, but, the, but, but the, the most common star in the galaxy, seventy percent of them, I believe, are red dwarf stars. Very small, but very long lived, very frugal. And it used to be thought you couldn't have a habitable planet around these things because it would have to be close in, one face to the to the star, like the moon has one face to, to the earth. So. You 
you think that the air on such a planet would freeze out on the far side? Now there are models, at least, which show that that may not be true. An atmosphere might conduct heat around the, 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 this world. It's still a tricky place to live. The star might flare and so forth. But even so, if it's possible that this 70% mass of, 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 of stars are potentially habitable, then suddenly the universe is enormously generous potentially for 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 for, for life for places to live it's, everyone it's, it's wants to jump in on this but may, may i just ask as, as the guy in the chair um our star our, our sun will become a red dwarf is that right a red dwarf is just later no no carol's saying no that's not true no our star will become a red giant in its next phase of evolution uh, when it runs out of hydrogen fuel at the core then it will collapse in the central regions and swell up in the outer regions and actually engulf the earth but we don't that need to worry right. about this for three and a half billion years, at least. All right. So, you know, I think there are other more pressing things we should worry about. Well, those as a of species. us not working on the Today programme don't need to worry about that then. Kevin. But I mean, what's fascinating here is what we're all talking about around the table is the challenge, I think, or one of the big challenges for science in the 21st century, is, which is what is the ubiquity of life in the universe? complex or otherwise and you know whether, whether through uh, science fiction here or, or through carol's exploratory efforts or indeed what martin's proposing and and that's why i think it's so exciting and that's why i think tim peake's mission is so exciting because a lot of those answers are to be had on the moon and the surface of mars uh, and i think at least in the near term that's going to need human presence to uh, to unlock some of those secrets the answer to the question of whether or not when you look into the night sky what you're looking at is a desert or a jungle is probably there on the surface of the moon and on Mars, I think. Martin Rees. Of course, if we found evidence of any kind of life in our solar system, on Mars or maybe under the uh, ice on the moon of Jupiter, Europa, or the moon of Saturn, Enceladus, that would be very exciting. If you could show there was life there which had an independent origin, that would show that life must be ubiquitous because if, if it starts twice in one planetary system, then it must, it must everywhere. happen everywhere. Absolutely. And that's why it is indeed important to see if there's any kind of life anywhere in our solar system. But, of course, if we're looking further afield, we have to ask, would the life be... RNA, DNA, like the life on Earth, or could there be other chemical bases? Here again, we can get some clues from uh, biochemistry, but some from observations. That's very, very exciting. As regards the role of people, uh, I think I agree with Kevin that at the moment, uh, no robotic probe can uh, uh, do the kind of things that a the trained geologist could do. But uh, I think robots are catching up, and that's why I must admit to being ambivalent about the whole idea of manned space flight more than 30 or 40 years ahead, because the robots Robots then will be as good as us, they're more cheap to launch and they don't need to come back. I want to come to those very modest subjects, the origin of life and the future of life, just in a little in a little moment. But we have so far established that it is possible for humans to live in space for quite a long period of time and that there are places we might want to visit. The next question, therefore, is, is it possible for us physically and in terms of theoretical maths and so forth to actually get there? Because you are talking about unimaginably large distances. Stephen Baxter. Um, the, well, well, let's hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, well, there are a whole range of technologies. But ordinary uh, rockets are not going to go fast enough to get us to Alpha Centauri. No, or, or, no, or no, no, no. Uh, it's, it's, it's the fuel mass load as well. If you think of the of the of the size of the space shuttle to launch a few people into space into into low Earth orbit, um, uh, uh, the more the more the, the further you want to go, the more fuel you have to lift to lift the fuel that gets you further out and so forth. So you're looking at so, so this is all self-indulgent piffle, unless there is a way of getting to some of those exoplanets, at least theoretically. Um, and you have uh, a version in your book, The Ark. I don't know if it's plausible or not, because I'm, I'm not a mathematician. Well, in, in, in Ark, I've, um, I've, I've pushed the boundaries a bit. There are, there are actually theoretical models of how something like a warp drive could work faster than light. You, kind of, you don't move through space-time faster than light. You, you surf on a wave of space-time which can move faster than light. A chap called Al Kubia, based in Wales, I think, came up with this model a few years ago, and the science fiction writers leapt on it <laughs> and, have, and, have, and, have, and have clung to this ever since. But there are lower I tech ways. A bit it, no. <laughs> but, there, but there are lower tech ways we, we, we could get out there, such as solar sails. Uh, you, you, you ride on the I sunlight. Know, NASA um, have been looking at solar sails for yeah, some time, yeah. haven't they? Um, I think we could fairly plausibly think of ways to get to Alpha Centauri, the nearest star, in centuries, let's say. But then you have the whole logistical problem of maintaining a habitat for centuries and keep getting people there intact and sane at the other end.
Martin Rees, you, so you think that's flaky. Is there any non-flaky possibilities <laughs> of getting these exoplanets? Well, I think Stephen is right in saying we could get there in a few centuries with a nuclear-powered rocket. But I think there the question is, uh, would it be... Uh, feasible on uh, physiological or psychological grounds for people to embark on a voyage where there'd be some intermediate generations that would really uh, live in interstellar space, which is a very boring environment indeed. My personal take is that Obviously, one would first send uh, a robotic probes, but also I think that this interstellar travel is not a human but a post-human enterprise. Mm. I think if we look a few centuries ahead, then maybe there'll be creatures with a life span far greater than ours and if you're going to live for 10,000 years then to doddle to go to Alpha Centauri and so I think if the lifespan is increased or if of course uh, the machines have taken over then we'll have interstellar travel but the uh, scenario in uh, um, Stephen's book about uh, this multi-generational community living in a rather fractious uh, mm. community in interstellar space, I think that's psychologically very difficult. maybe difficult and very unattractive for anyone Stephen wants to Fong. Kevin Fong. And, you know, we always have these, these discussions about when it is that machines will outperform humans. And, I, you know, I've no doubt that, that machines are going to be capable of some incredible things in the next century. Um, but I do say to, to my colleagues uh, with whom I have these discussions that at the point at which machines are more capable than humans in every other way you've got more problems than whether or not they're exploring space for you uh, uh, you know whether or not they should have a vote we, is we, we do want to come on to those absolutely um, but but Stephen Baxter before we leave the idea of humans traveling through deep space what I was very interested in in your book Ark um, is that it's not so much the physiological uh, problems they have, although people have to work out in the gym and when they eventually emerge are kind of etiolated and a bit pale and, and wimpy looking. Um, it's the political problems and it's the psychological problems. People go mad in space and then of course, um, you know, the old Adam, uh, dictators take over and politics intervenes. In other words you're, you're taking into deep space all the problems that we have down here. Well, indeed, you know, you, ha you, you, you start with a cadre of very highly trained, highly motivated, like, like, a, like, like, like 80 Tim Peaks um, 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 setting off, but they're competitive and they're confined and they quickly, very quickly fall out. They try a, a series of political uh, forms, such as a total consensus, but that gets nowhere. The st strong individuals emerge. So you have to have your Aristotle and your Plato on board, basically. Yeah. In the end, everything breaks down. It's kind of lifeboat rules. You know, your only right is to be kept alive. But, yet the, but you're right that the, inter the most interesting problem is what happens to the children. They're born. You know, there's a question of rights here. You know, do you have the right to, to, to bring up a child whose only role is to s maintain the ship for 50 years and then produce more children for the, for the later generations? They can nothing. They know nothing of Earth. They can, that can nothing for the goals of the mission. They start doing, doing graffiti art and, 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 and so forth and, and create, the, create their own culture within the confines of the ship, which I think is pretty realistic, probably. And the challenge is actually to educate them somehow. huge ethical questions about whether you, yeah. live, you, you, you bring people up to live their entire lives and die in a tin can. In ARC, it's an emergency, as you said, and mm. so there's no choice but to do this in this way. Um, but, uh, but I think there are strong ethical questions about whether it, it's right to do that, yes. Carol? Yeah, so as a mother, one of the things that really worried me about your book was the idea of having toddlers on the spaceship and just yeah. having toddlers in a normal suburban <laughs> home is quite yeah. is quite challenging and having them on a spaceship struck me as being very worrying. Well, and, and, and in fact, I, th I think in fact uh, children in general, that, that you couldn't allow them to be curious and poke and explore and fiddle and learn. But you, the, 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 the ship is going to be very fragile, let's face it, you know, and you, you certainly don't want them unscrewing mm. the bolts to see what's, out, what's outside. So it's a, a, a totally inhuman environment mm. in that way. You don't want them to explore. And, and so this is, we're, we're getting to the areas um, which explain why Martin Rees is so interested in post-human <laughs> life forms. Mm. Now, one of, the, one of the phrases you keep using, Martin, is, is wet chemical brains. And whether wet chemical brains, which is what there are five wet chemical brains <laughs> hanging around this table, whether that's the only possible kind of consciousness, which I this wet chemical brain finds quite hard to get itself around. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit more about, about silicon consciousness. Well, I think we have to imagine what's going to happen in the next few centuries. And it's quite on the cards that uh, machines will eventually achieve human capabilities in more and more respects. The direction of travel is clear, the speed of travel is a bit uncertain, but many people think that there will be machines which have many human capabilities by the end of a century. 
Of course, whether they have consciousness or whether they're zombies, we don't know, and therefore whether we but it's, should sorry, assign them it's, rights, we it's don't know. It's possible, you yeah. think, that there could be something called silicon consciousness, in other words, that a, a form of self-consciousness downloaded onto pieces of silicon. Well, indeed, this is a big philosophical debate, whether indeed, yeah. consciousness is something special to the wet organic brains that we have or whether it emerges when you've got a computer of sufficient complexity. In the latter case, then you can imagine that the computers will eventually uh, take over and, of course, they are the ones who are going to um, be able to uh, carry the far future. There are billions of years ahead. Uh, and so, if you look at it this way, then uh, organic intelligence and technology is just a thin sliver of time compared to the four billion years of evolution that led to us and the three and a half billion years which, uh, Carol says, lies ahead. So, most of the uh, intelligence and most of the thinking that's ever done is going to be done so, by, by these. And they are the ones that will live long enough that they can uh, go to interstellar um, trips without all these uh, uh, nightmarish possibilities that we've Absolutely. discussed. Absolutely. But that suggests that we and everybody listening to this programme are merely an indeterminate, intermediate kind of life species on the way to something else. But not the culmination. Of but evolution. not the culmination. Absolutely. Kevin. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I agree, actually, in the long term, machine capability is going to just uh, improve vastly. But it's hard to think about artificial consciousness because, you know, in my day job, my primary medical training is uh, as an anaesthetist and in intensive care. But as an anaesthetist, I render people unconscious on a regular basis. Now, in we, Martin's world, you could simply pull the plug out. <laughs> you, you, you could, and that would make my job yeah. much easier. But but, um, but here's the thing. We, we, we have tried to have these monitors that can detect when you're unconscious and when you're conscious because you don't want your patient to be awake during an anaesthetic. Uh, and that turns out to be really hard to do. And as one of my colleagues pointed out, the problem is, is that we can't define consciousness and so mm. finding a machine that can detect its absence is slightly tricky so mm. making machines that are capable of this i mean i mean trickier <laughs> infinitely more tricky and absolutely and of course uh, it's irrelevant actually if we just want to use them to explore the universe whether they're conscious or not we want to know what their capabilities are um, I don't really know that you're conscious you could be a zombie <laughs> and how would i know um, and so what we want to have is com computers and robots which uh, can survive these trips to these interspecies places and can report back and can uh, uh, adjust to their environment. You can take my word for it that I'm not a zombie. <laughs> There's no zombies around this table, I'm sure. But um, when, we, when we're looking at the purpose of all of this, of mm. course, it depends. Is the purpose, as in Stephen's book, to give mankind a fresh start, having ruined this planet on another planet somewhere in, in, the, in the future? Or is it simply to find out what the rest of the universe looks like? I mean, you can, you can presumably download the late quartets of uh, Shostakovich and, and the writings of Marcel Proust and Einstein's mathematics onto a computer and send that off and, as it were, keep it safe on a distant exoplanet. Mm -hmm. but, but it would not be a human colony of any kind that we would recognise. No, and I think it's... it's I, I, I think, speaking as a human, you know, I think it's... Uh, I, think, I think we've, we've still got a lot to give. I'd like to imagine a partnership, you know, where we're taken along to apprehend the universe in a way that no machine ever could. Look at it that way. And look at the past, look at what humans have done in terms of exploration before. The, the Ice Age wanderers who crossed the, the, the land bridge from Asia into America. Beringia. Maybe if, maybe a few, uh, Australia, India, and uh, maybe a few waves of them. And they created a culture with cities and religions and, 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 and political structures and all that stuff that they did in the old world, but, but in a uniquely different way, in a different environment. Take us to Mars and we will do something similar, I'm sure. You know, it's, so it's a kind of a, you're exploring the universe, but you're also exploring the potentials for human development. And the other thing, of course, we're asking ourselves is, is there alternative life out there? We started mm. talking about this, Martin Rees. Yes. Well, that's a crucial question. Of course, if life were entirely unique to this planet, then, of course, we'd all think that it would be uh, uh, such, a, such a sad waste if it was snuffed out and didn't continue here on Earth or far beyond. And that's why Stephen's book is so important, because it indicates that uh, even if the Earth were to... Uh, become inhospitable, then life could develop somewhere else. Of course, if there is already life out there, and of course there are some people mm. who are looking for evidence of it, for intelligent life, then although human extinction matters to humans, it doesn't matter so much in a cosmic perspective because there may be other equally sophisticated entities out there already. So I think the question of whether there's advanced life and not merely simple life 
on any of these planets around other stars is a very crucial question. So I, I was wondering how many members of SETI, that's the search for extraterrestrial yeah. intelligence, there are sitting around the table. Um, <laughs> I, I, two. Yeah. Two, and one no. of them is Carol. No, I'm, I'm not, not a member not. of SETI. I just, I just wanted to say that what Martin just said almost sort of implies that we shouldn't be worried about all of the other species on the Earth that are becoming extinct because of our activities, because, you know, we're still here and there are um, other living things. I think... Oh, I didn't I think mean to say a, that. I think a, yeah, but the, the, the analogy, they have value the anal in their own right in yes, respect exactly. of their value to us. And I think we have value in our own right. And I think, you know, if you look at all of the things that have been achieved in human history, I think that it's important that we try and preserve that heritage even if we're only one of many intelligent yeah. species and, in the galaxy, and, and, I don't think we are, actually. Absolutely, so, and, yeah. at, yeah. and, at, and at species level, it's just reprehensible to behave in this fashion that you just trash one planet and then move on to another. I mean, of course, this is the primary mm. concern. This is our primary uh, um, um, home. Um, however, when we're talking about extraterrestrial life, um, I, I think it's quite interesting to, to, to discuss what we might be talking about because the, the assumption that Tim Peake is up there and there's going to be a knock on the window and something can stare in at it's going to be something very, very unlike us, is it not? We're talking about civilizations which may have vanished a long time ago but leaving behind electromagnetic waves or whatever. We've absolutely no idea what might be out there. We're pretty sure there's nothing very advanced elsewhere in our solar system, but we've no idea what might be out there. And indeed, it could be uh, something which is um, uh, biological in some way, maybe different chemistry, or it could be that it is some kind of uh, machines which are the legacy of some earlier organic civilization that's long dead. That's why we should look by all possible methods for life in any forms. I mean, as you know, there are attempts to look for some kind of artificial uh, radio or optical emissions coming from distant parts of the universe, but we should look for other things. We should look for strange artefacts in our solar system. Uh, we should look in all possible ways, because the detection of any evidence, any fossil, as it were, of an advanced civilization or advanced structure mm. from beyond the solar system would be, of course, of colossal philosophical importance. Speaking of philosophical importance, is it possible that we have all evolved in, in three dimensions, four plus time, um, and we now know that we're, we talk about 11 dimensions and so forth, that other life forms out there might be completely invisible to us because they are in other dimensions and different orders of reality? Well, they could be. I think if we think of the aftermath of our Big Bang, which includes all the stars and galaxies we can see, it looks as though that is really three-dimensional and the physical laws are the same everywhere. But... Uh, uh, going into cosmology, there is the idea that our Big Bang is not the only one, and there could indeed be other cosmoses, other mm. space times, which are governed by different laws, different dimensions, and then all bets are off. And, of course, it's even harder for us to conceive them. And an important thing, uh, in my opinion, is to realise that uh, just as um, uh, human beings are not the culmination of evolution... Um, our brains may not be uh, capable as of... As good as it gets. Uh, indeed, absolutely. <laughs> and there may be important aspects of reality which are just beyond human capacity to grasp, just like um, quantum theories beyond a chimpanzee. Absolutely. Um, Stephen, one, one of the uh, possibilities that you raise in this book, since we're talking about other civilizations, is, of course, for us to make contact with anything remotely like us, there would have to be the huge coincidence of them being at roughly the same um, order of development as we are. Yeah. And it's, the, it's equally likely, as you posit on one of your planets, that uh, we are latecomers in the universe, that actually most of the other civilizations have long gone. Well, it's possible. I, I, I think it's true that, this, that the universe is getting dimmer already. It's already past its peak of star making. Although I think there are some studies that say there may be more planets in the future. So, so the, the, you know, the, the universe goes through these ages of, of, of development. So maybe the, the great civilizations lie somewhere in the past. But it's strange, though. I mean, the, the discovery of the exoplanets, the more we learn about living in space, the possibility that maybe something like post-human technologies, the artificial technologies will spread through the universe, increases the, the mystery of why we don't see them. Why why hasn't somebody else done this and filled the place with robots? Hmm. It may be that um, we're, we're being protected from this vision somehow because everything we see seems to be, seems to be a consequence of simple natural law working itself out. Or it so may something be as, could be hiding. Yes, or it may be, as Martin says, that we're just not smart enough to perceive <laughs> what it is we're supposed to perceive. Um, 
Carol, um, like Kevin, you've been quite sort of dubious about the idea of travelling to, to exoplanets yeah. and very determined that this is our home and we must look after it properly and all the creatures on it quite right and all the rest of it. So what is for you the point of looking at exoplanets? What is the excitement? What is the future? Well, I think I think it's a, it's an expression of the fundamental desire to explore that people have. We want to understand the world around us. We want to explore the places that are physically accessible. And I think you know that's what is the essence of being human: wanting to understand things. And but by exploring, you mean looking, not grabbing. If I can put it in, like that. In terms in terms of exoplanets, I think it's going to be a long time, if ever, before we can go there. But I think it's it's incredibly interesting and exciting to actually know what's out there. And one of the things that I think is amazing is the fact that our brains are able to understand as much as they can about the galaxy, about mm. astrophysics, about the universe, because there's Some absolutely... Some of our brains. My, absolutely, my, this one is struggling. There's absolutely no reason yeah. why we should have evolved in such a way and that mathematics should be accessible to us that explains so many phenomena in the universe. Mm. Uh, um, well, and this, when we talk about exploration, it's a very, very broad thing. I mean, this is one of the themes of this year's Royal Institution Christmas Lectures, that although we celebrate Tim's progress aboard the International Space Station, actually, that is the re uh, result of thousands, not tens of thousands of scientists, technologists and engineers working in concert to achieve this thing. So is the search for exoplanets. And so in the 21st century, all of us can be explorers in our own way, in our own time, how we want to be. And and the adventures that Carol talks about are every bit as real uh, as the adventures that Tim and my colleagues who are astronauts have aboard the space station. And so, um, you know, I think exploration is a much broader thing than simply putting one foot in front of another and sticking a flag in something. Mm. Martin Rees. Um, Absolutely, and I think it's very important that uh, we do cherish this planet because it's a dangerous illusion to think that we can evacuate and go somewhere else because mm -hmm. I think we'd all agree there's nowhere in our solar system which is even as hospitable as the South Pole or the top of Everest. So even though I hope that there will, within a 100 years, be communities of people living maybe on Mars, uh, they will be uh, living in an uncomfortable way and they'll be pioneers not uh, mm. routine people. They'd be rather like uh, Serrano Fines who dragged a sledge to the <laughs> South Pole in Antarctica. And Antarctic then spent his time in an igloo. Uh, there'll be igloos, as it were. On Absolutely. Mars. And yeah. uh, also um, uh, Elon Musk, who's the head of SpaceX mm. programme, he says that he wants to die on Mars, but not on impact. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's 44 years old now, and 40 years from now, it may be possible for might, people to might get his go to Mars and not merely orbit around it, but actually land and uh, live out their days there. Carol. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on something that Stephen said earlier about possibly, you know, everything is past its peak and we're latecomers to the party mm. and perhaps habitable niches in the galaxy are are dying out. And there was one um, piece of research that we did recently um, where we looked at the possibility for setting up a stable planet in the habitable zone around a white dwarf star. So we talked a little what, bit... Making your own? No, no. just looking at the just mm. looking at the um, the parameters that you you would have. If if you follow the evolution of the sun past the red giant phase where it swallows the Earth, ultimately it becomes a white dwarf. It no longer generates energy from nuclear burning, and it's just a sort of a cooling ember, a relic of the previous of the previous um, energy of the star. So everybody had always thought that they, they just cool down. So if you put a planet in orbit around a white dwarf, it would not stay at the right temperature for very long. But it turns out that there's a particular subset of white dwarfs where you can have a planet at about the right temperature for billions of years. So it could be as the galaxy evolves and all of the stars burn their nuclear fuel, you could still have... You know, a plethora of habitable environments in the galaxy. So the long-term you know, habitability of the galaxy may actually be quite promising. Kevin. And we're talking here uh, a lot about very far-flung futures, but I, I think I'd like to make the point that it's super hard to... To, to predict where we're going. Uh, and I was standing uh, at the Royal Institution give, give, rehearsing for one of the lectures this year and thinking, if I was giving these lectures 100 years ago, in 1915, not 2015, we'd be talking about the merits of polar exploration. Was it worth it? And would we do anything with it? And would people do anything useful here? And yet, Still a good um, question. Uh, well, <laughs> well I, I, think, I think actually some of the polar ice cores we've got have told us about the atmosphere of the past that give us some of the most important information we have about global warming today. And so you could say that it is information mm. that's literally safe 
saving the planet. We could never have predicted that in 1915. So this is only 100 years later in a time in which we went across the world, into the skies and out into space. So who knows what we'll do in the next 100 years, let alone in the next 1,000. Mm. Martin. And, of course, Carol was looking ahead more than three or four billion years to the far future when our sons died. But it is important to bear in mind that that long future does exist. Uh, indeed, maybe the future infinite. To quote Woody Allen, eternity is very long, especially towards the end. <laughs> and there's plenty of time. And so evolution has more time ahead of it than up till now. Moreover, evolution is going to be much faster because it's going to happen on a technological time scale, mm. not the Darwinian selection time scale. So far more can happen in the next uh, thousands or millions of years than happened in the equivalent time span in the past. And, and that, I think, is a very exciting prospect. Well, that, that, I'm, I'm interested in that because it does seem to me that we live in a very, very pessimistic civilization at the moment. We basically think things are going to get worse and worse for our mm. children, our grandchildren and so forth. <laughs> and we're all looking for sources of optimism. Carol, is this the source of optimism we've been searching for? Well, I, I think that actually we live in the best time ever. You know, more people on the planet are educated now than ever before. More people have choices, and collectively as a species, you know, I think our future more, I is guess. in our own hands. And you know, coming back to what Stephen said earlier about whether it was ethical to raise a generation whose only job was to just, you know, survive, just cling keep, on keep while the wet everyone. Going. That's mm. actually been the fate of most people in the history of the human race. Oh, yes. Most people Very have, have been subsisting. Yeah. And we are incredibly lucky to be alive now when we have all these choices, all these mm. possibilities. Mm. And, and if you look at the history of science fiction in terms of pessimism and optimism, there is this kind of pattern. There's always a dreadful bottleneck in the near future. H.G. Wells said it was going to be a war with Germany, which might destroy civilization, And then it will be utopia. where uh, in, in, in When Doctor Who was born in the 60s, there was going to be a terrible nuclear war. And then we'd get off to the planet. Now it's climate collapse and resource depletion and all this. And then we'll be... So there's always a short-term pessimism and longer-term optimism. So I, I, I feel, you know... A final word from Martin okay. Rees. Well, Carol's right that we can be technical optimists because we have the capacity to provide a better life for everyone. But, of course, the downside is that... Uh, things can go wrong more seriously. We've entered what's called the Anthropocene, a geological era where the planet is determined in its fate by what humans do. But there's a lot to look forward to. On that happy note at last, thanks to all my guests, you can see Kevin Fong's Royal Institution Christmas Lectures, How to Survive in Space, from next Monday evening at 8 on BBC4. Martin Rees will be taking part in the public debate at the Science Museum in the new year on human spaceflight. Is it worth the money and risk? We were discussing Stephen Baxter's novel, Ark. And Carol Haswell from the Open University has recently written a book on transiting exoplanets. Next week, a real treat at the Playhouse Theatre at the Globe, Shakespeare's late plays, with guests including Simon Russell Beale and Jeanette Winterson. But for now, thank you and have a very Merry Christmas. There's more information about Start the Week on the programme's website. Go to bbc.co.uk where you'll also find many more Radio 4 programmes you can download for free.